Today I'm going to be discussing my personal favorite when it comes to computers. And this is the machine that I covet more than any other. As far as I'm concerned, it's probably the most beautiful machine built by anyone ever. And this is the Cray 2. Although it pains me deeply that I'll never be able to own one of these machines, I went and did the next best thing and acquired two modules for one. I therefore have in my collection a complete memory module as well as a power supply module from a Cray 2. I'm going to discuss these two modules in detail towards the end of the video, but before I do this, I'm going to give you a complete overview of the Cray 2. So here it goes. I'm going to start off with an introduction to the Cray 2 supercomputer system. The Cray 2 computer system set the standard for next generation supercomputers. It was characterized by a large common memory, 256 million 64 bit words, four background processors, a clock cycle of 4.1 nanoseconds, 4.1 billionths of a second, and liquid immersion cooling. It offered an effective throughput 6 to 12 times that of the Cray 1 and ran an operating system based on the increasingly popular Unix operating system. The Cray 2 computer system used the most advanced technology available at the time. The compact mainframe was immersed in fluorocarbon liquid that dissipated the heat generated by the densely packed electronic components. The logic and memory circuits were contained in eight layer, three dimensional modules. The large common memory was constructed of the most dense memory chips available and the logic circuits were constructed of the fastest silicon chips available. The Cray 2 mainframe contained four independent background processors, each more powerful than a Cray 1 supercomputer. Featuring a clock cycle time of 4.1 nanoseconds, faster than any other computer system available, each of these processors offered exceptional scalar and vector processing capabilities. The four background processors could operate independently on separate jobs or concurrently on a single problem. Very high speed local memory, integral to each background processor, was available for temporary storage of vector and scalar data. Common memory was one of the most important features of the Cray 2. It consisted of 256 million 64 bit words randomly accessible from any of the four background processors and from any of the high speed and common data channels. The memory was arranged in four quadrants of 128 interleaved banks. All memory access was performed automatically by the hardware. Any user could use all or part of this memory. In conventional memory limited computer systems, I.O. white times for large problems that used out of memory storage ran into hours. With the large common memory of the Cray 2, many of these problems became CPU bound. Control of network access equipment and high speed disk drives were integral to the Cray 2 mainframe hardware. A single foreground processor coordinated the data flow between the system common memory and all of the external devices across four high-speed I.O. channels. The synchronous operation of the foreground processor with the four background processors and external devices provide a significant increase in data throughput. To complement the new Cray 2 architecture, Cray 2 developed an interactive operating system based on AT&T's Unix System 5. The Cray 2 operating system was supported by a Fortran compiler based on the proven Cray Research Fortran compiler CFT. I'm now quickly going to summarize the features of the Cray 2. The machine featured an extremely large directly addressable common memory and had the fastest cycle time available in a computer at 4.1 nanoseconds. The machine also featured scalar and vector processing combined with multiprocessing and had an integral foreground processor. The machine itself had an elegant architecture and extremely high reliability and made use of high density memory chips and extremely fast silicon logic chips. The machine also featured liquid immersion cooling and had an operating system based on the industry recognized Unix operating system. There was also a automatic vectorizing Fortran compiler available for the system. I'm now going to cover the physical characteristics of the Cray 2. The Cray 2 mainframe was elegant in appearance as well as in architecture. The memory, computer logic and DC power supplies were integrated into a compact mainframe composed of 14 vertical columns 
arranged in a 300 degree arc. The upper part of each column contained a stack of 24 modules and the lower part contained power supplies for the system. The total cabinet's height, including the power supplies, was 45 inches and the diameter of the mainframe was 53 inches. Thus, the footprint of the mainframe was a mere 16 square feet of floor space. An inert fluorocarbon liquid circulated in the mainframe cabinet in direct contact with the integrated circuit packages. This liquid immersion cooling technology allowed for the small size of the Cray 2 mainframe and was thus largely responsible for the high computation rates. I'm now quickly going to summarize the physical characteristics of the Cray 2. The machine occupied only 16 square feet of floor space and stood 45 inches high and had a diameter of 53 inches and weighed a total of 5,500 pounds. The system consisted of 14 columns arranged in a 300 degree arc and made use of liquid immersion cooling and the chips used were 16 gate array logic chips. And these chips were housed in three dimensional modules and there were 320 such modules in a complete system. The system consumed a total of 195 kilowatts of power and was supplied with 400 hertz power from motor generators. And the system also made use of chilled water heat exchange. I'm now going to cover the Cray 2's architecture and design. In addition to the cooling technology, the Cray 2's extremely high processing rates were achieved by a balanced integration of scalar and vector capabilities and a very large common memory in a multi-processing environment. The significant architectural components of the Cray 2 computer system included four identical background processors, 256 million 64-bit words of common memory, a foreground processor, and a maintenance control console. Each of the four identical background processors contained registers and functional units to perform both vector and scalar operations. The single foreground processor supervised the four background processors while the large common memory complemented the processors and provided architectural balance, thus assuring extremely high throughput rates. On-site maintenance was possible via the maintenance control console. I'm now going to cover the system's background processors. Each background processor consisted of a computation section, a control section, and a high-speed local memory. The computation section performed arithmetic and logical calculations. These operations and the other functions of a background processor were coordinated through the control section. The control section had the following characteristics. It contained eight instruction buffers, each holding 64 16-bit instruction parcels, 128 basic instruction codes, a 32-bit program address register, a 32-bit base address register, a 32-bit limit address register, a 64-bit real-time clock, 8 semaphore flags to provide interlocks for common memory access, and a 32-bit status register. Local memory was used to store temporarily scalar and vector data during computations. Each local memory was 16,384 64-bit words. The computation section contained registers and functional units that operated together to execute a program of instructions stored in memory. I'm now going to cover the system's local memory. Each background processor contained 16,384 64-bit words of local memory. Local memory was treated as a register file to hold scalar operands during computation. It was also used for temporary storage of vector segments where those segments were used more than once in a computation in the vector registers. The access time for local memory was four clock periods and accesses could overlap accesses to common memory. This local memory replaced the B and the T registration of the Cray 1 and was readily available for user jobs. One application was for small matrices. Each background processor had a 64-bit real-time clock. These clocks and the foreground processor real-time clock were synchronized at system startup and were advanced by one count in each clock period. 
I'm now going to cover background processor intercommunication. Synchronization of two or more background processors cooperating on a single job was achieved through the use of one of eight semaphore flags shared by the background processors. These flags were one-bit registers providing interlocks for common memory access to shared memory fields. A background processor was assigned access to one semaphore flag by a field in the status register. The background processor had instructions to test and branch, set and clear a semaphore flag. I'm now going to cover the system's common memory. One of the primary technological advantages of the Cray 2 computer system was its extremely large directly accessible common memory. Featuring 268,435,456 words, this common memory was significantly larger than that offered by any other commercially available computer system. It allowed the individual user to run programs that would not be possible to run on any other system. It also enhanced multi-programming by allowing an exponential increase in the number of jobs that could reside concurrently in memory. Common memory was arranged in four quadrants of 32 banks each for a total of 128 banks. A word of memory consisted of 64 data bits and 8 error correction bits. This memory was shared by the foreground processor, background processors and peripheral equipment controllers. Each bank of memory had an independent data path to each of the four common memory ports. Each bidirectional common memory port connected to a background processor and a foreground communications channel. The total memory bandwidth was 64 gigabits or 1 million words per second. I'm now going to cover the foreground processor and I.O. section. The foreground processor supervised overall system activity among the foreground processor, background processors, common memory and peripheral controllers. System communication occurred through four high-speed synchronous data channels. Firmware control programs for normal system operation and a set of diagnostic routines for system maintenance were integral to the foreground processor. Control circuitry for external devices was also located within the Cray 2 mainframe. I'm now going to cover the foreground communication channels. The foreground processor was connected to four 4 gigabit communication channels. These channels linked the background processors, foreground processor, peripheral controllers and common memory. Each channel connected one background processor, a group of peripheral controllers, one common memory port and the foreground processor. Data traffic traveled directly between controllers and common memory. I'm now going to cover the system's liquid immersion cooling system. Effective cooling techniques were central to the design for high-speed computational systems. Densely packed components resulted in shorter signal paths, thus contributing to higher speeds. Traditionally, the trade-off was lower reliability due to increased operating temperatures, but this was no longer a limitation. The liquid immersion cooling technology used by the Cray 2 was a breakthrough in the design of cooling systems for large-scale computers. It placed the cooling medium in direct contact with the components to be cooled, thus effectively reducing and stabilizing the operating temperature and increasing system reliability. The Cray 2 mainframe operated in a cabinet filled with a colorless, odorless, inert fluorocarbon fluid. The fluid was non-toxic non-flammable and had a high dielectric or insulating properties. It also had high thermal stability and outstanding heat transfer properties. The coolant flowed through the module circuit boards at a velocity of 1 inch per second and was in direct contact with the integrated circuit packages and power supplies. I'm now going to discuss the system's modular design. The Cray 2 hardware was constructed of synchronous networks of binary circuits. These circuits were packaged in 320 pluggable modules, each of which contained approximately 750 integrated circuit packages. The total integrated circuit population in the system was approximately 240,000 chips, nearly 75,000 of which were memory. 
The pluggable modules were three-dimensional structures with an 8x8x12 array of circuit packages. Eight printed circuit boards formed the module structure. Circuit interconnections were made in all three dimensions within the module. Each module measured 1 by 4 by 8 inches and weighed 2 pounds and consisted of approximately 40% integrated circuits by volume and consumed between 300 and 500 watts of power. The Cray 2 common memory consisted of 128 memory banks with 2 million words per bank. Each memory bank occupied a circuit module. The Cray 2 logic networks were constructed of 16 gate array integrated circuit packages in three dimensional structures. I'm now going to cover the Cray 2's reliability. A notable increase in reliability was another benefit of the immersion cooling technology. All components rapidly dissipated heat to the fluid, thus preventing high chip temperatures. These chip temperatures were substantially lower than those achieved by other types of cooling, and as a result significantly reduced chip failure rates. Efficient heat dissipation also prevented destructive thermal shock that might have resulted from large temperature differentials and fluctuations. In addition, a 15 to 1 decrease in module count per CPU from the Cray 1 and a 10 to 1 reduction in memory module count enhanced failure isolation, producing a corresponding increase in maintenance efficiency. I'm now going to cover Cray 2 maintenance. If a module should fail, effective and timely maintenance was a routine operation. Diagnostic software quickly isolated the problem to a failing module. The immersion fluid was quickly pumped into the reservoir adjacent to the mainframe. The front panel was easily removed for ready access to the module, which could then be replaced. The front panel was then reinstalled and the fluid quickly returned to the mainframe. The entire operation required only a few minutes. Once the system was restarted, further diagnostics and repair of the faulty module could occur on site. This brings me to the part of the video where I discuss the two modules which I have personally, and I'll start off with the memory module. Okay, what you'll notice about the module is it is eight circuit boards thick, and the components on these boards are connected in all three dimensions. So you've got the traces which run along the circuit boards themselves and in between the circuit boards you actually have connectors which connect the circuit boards in the vertical plane. Okay. Taking a look at the front side of the module, you'll notice these connectors here and they serve two functions. Number one, they bolt the assembly into the machine and they also serve as the connections to the machine's DC bus bars which supply the power to the chips within the module. This tab on the front of the module serves as a tab which would normally be used to insert the module into the machine or remove it should it become faulty. On the back side of the module, you've got all the connections for the machine's logic. So these modules were very cleverly designed in that the power supply side was on the front of the module and the machine's logic side was towards the back side of the module. I'm now just going to take a quick look at my power supply module and the first thing you'll notice about the module are these two rather hefty three-phase transformers. Running adjacent to the transformers are two rows of diodes and these are very high-powered diodes used to rectify the three-phase AC to DC. Okay, the output then goes through a series of chokes from a rather thick set of wires towards a choke which is located on the front side of the module and what this choke would be used for would be to reduce the ripple voltage present on the output. These two connectors here would be connected to the ground bus bars and this connector here would be connected to the plus 5 volt bus bar. Okay, taking a look at the rear section of the module You've got the three-phase input here, as well as another set of connectors on the other side, and what those are are actually sense connectors. I'm just going to turn the module over so that you can see the underside of it. Okay, and from this side you can see the three-phase input here, which is then distributed between the two transformers, 
And then you've got these two sense lines which come in, which root towards a wire, which is wound around the central choke in the center of the module. Okay, and what I would surmise is that this is to determine whether there is AC present on the output. And that would more than likely signal the failure of one of the rectification diodes. This concludes my discussion on the Cray 2, and I really hope that you enjoyed the video and found it to be informative.